now I know why Scott loves teaching. Wow, talk about a boost to your whole soul. Um, and I've got to say right off the bat that I believe that that is exactly what. Can you turn it up a little bit, move it up. I believe that that cheering section that I just heard is what you have on the other side of the veil cheering for you now in mortality. As Scott said, um, I did. I lost my spouse seven years ago in a plane crash, and I'm going to touch on that briefly. But I want you guys to know that in every decision that you make and in every piece and part of your life, it is absolutely imperative that you have the Lord involved with you in your decisions. That is not just a personal journey. That is a business journey. That is a social journey. That is every part of your life. Maybe if I drape this around myself like a scarf, does that help hold it where it belongs better? Um, so it's really, really important. Um, my journey, we're going to talk a little bit. How many of you have been to one of my lectures before, just so I have an idea? Okay, we got a couple of you. Good. Now I can know this is like a fairly clean slate. Um, I want to talk about the magic sauce for life and business. Does anybody know what that might be? There's lots of, lots of pieces and parts to any good sauce, but I'm going to present a couple in this along with some basic business principles about life that I think are important. First of all, I think that genuine, honorable people with incredible heart and soul are a critical part of life personally and as a business. And I'm going to introduce you to some of them. One of them being, this is my brother. My brother is... He's five years younger than I am. He was born when I was five, and I got the wonderful opportunity of racing my mom up in the middle of the night to get this young man at the time, little baby, along with his twin brother. And so if you can picture, ladies, uh, a five-year-old, about how tall is a five-year-old, right? Getting up in the middle of the night, mom needs to feed the babies, but of course they were my babies. Just ask me. I would go in, and I would scoop them up, one in each arm, plug each mouth with their binky, and I'd rock in a chair with them for about an hour until I could hold them off no longer between feedings and mom comes to rescue them or me. I don't know which, but I would go back to bed. I cannot guarantee I did not choke once or twice, if you figure, you know, a little five-year-old picking up a child. But luckily, it did no damage or the damage that it did because Mike will claim that he is not only dyslexic, he'll write things backwards, but he doesn't train like normal education does, but it, has, it never stopped him. So I don't know if that's to blame or to credit, but either way, we'll go with it. Um, some of the basic rules for life and business that I want you to be mindful of. Number one, God gave you life, and he is right there with you. When I said that the cheering that you did at the start of this is what I picture it's like on the other side of the veil with every individual who walks with you, I believe that to be wholeheartedly true, and I will give some examples and things as we go forward. It's also incredible that we have a life, and our life is our playground. It's a gift to us. God gave us life. He gave us opportunity to learn and grow and apply the things that we learn. And my opinion is, have fun, eat chocolate. You may as well enjoy the process, or what's the point, right? He didn't say, come here and be miserable. Come here and be happy and find joy. And the other thing is that you need to take baby steps. Okay, you guys are all college, you're away from home for probably the first time for most of you, unless you've been on missions, and you're taking baby steps in your own life beyond home with your family. So some of my baby steps in business began when I was in Israel. I was raised there from the time that I was six to nine, and to support our family in business, we would collect water from all the major bodies of water, the Red Sea, Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee. We'd put them in bottles, we'd label them. We also collected sand and salt and things from the different areas as well. We even collected rocks from the valley where David slew Goliath and took slingshots and put them together along with the water. And as six years, seven year old, eight years, nine year old, there was 11 kids in my family, so there was a bunch of us. We would sell these to the tourists as they would come through. Well, this entrepreneurial spirit started there for me at that age for my twin brother and partner. Um, for him and the twin brother, it started with posters. 
And those two twins could get into anything. Mom would put the latches on the cupboards, and one twin would pull it open, the other one would crawl through. They'd pull out every piece and part that they could find. If there was a way to tear it apart, they did it. And then mom says, no, if you're going to tear it apart, you've got to put it back together. So they put the toaster back together, and then they moved on to lawnmowers. And lawnmowers are great because they make a lot of noise and they poof smoke. Well, mom got tired of them taking apart things that they needed during the week, so she'd take them to the junkyard and let them pick out their, their weapon of choice to tear apart and put back together. And that then moved on to dune buggies. Well, picture two 15, almost 16-year-old boys, and I say they weren't quite 16 yet um, because that's when they started. And they just got done putting their, their dune buggy together. They had worked all summer long to buy the parts. They had bought a brand new speaker system, which at the time in the 80s, was you know probably an $800 system, so they didn't spare any expense on that. They had just finished charging the battery, the battery chargers plugged in, the, they're adjusting some things on the line, and wouldn't you know, the, the wonderful explosive event. I go, oh crap, and I jump and I grab the plug and went, Poof. we rolled the car out here and just fried. <laughs> Okay, how many parents at this particular point in time are going to say, we're done? I am out. You blew up the garage. It was like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went back in. I mean, they, they saw the puddle start to move. They moved to the dune buggy to push it out. The reason the dune buggy is sitting in the curb and gutter is because they didn't want it to explode. They didn't care about the house. They didn't want it to explode, but the trail of fuel moved all the way out to the curb, so the fire followed it all the way back in. The door, when Dad went to open the door from the kitchen into the garage, licked flames in at him. So, you know, you think about a parent here. This is, this is expensive, expensive learning. But, you know, it's part of life. Rule number four in life and business is trauma is going to happen. You've got to embrace it. It's part of the journey. And my parents knew that, which was a beautiful thing. Because at any point in time, back at the lawnmower, they could have said, no, we need working things. Quit tearing them apart. But they realized that these were... They were, they were minuscule things. They were great teaching tools that would help you in life. And the Lord is the same with you. You're going to have experiences in life that are traumatic to you. It's frustrating. You want to get something done, but it doesn't work quite right. But the Lord doesn't give up on you. He says, great, you burned the garage. Let's do it again. Do it better this time. He's on the other side encouraging you forward in everything you need to do because he knows that you have a mission here to serve. And that mission is critically important. And unless you learn through the baby steps of life, you're not going to get where you need to be for the big ones, the ones that you prepared for before coming here and the one he has confidence in you doing. So Mike did just that. He took and they went for round two on Dune Buggy and they created, uh, they got a brand new, bought a brand new uh, Jeep, cut it in half, right chop down. You'll notice they added an extra axle. It's a six-wheeled system, and it drives with a joystick. And all three axles move on their own. You think about the engineering behind that back in the 80s for these young kids to do that. It was really kind of fun. And they created the rock, call, the rock crawl, which is a, a nationally known challenge, and put those events on in Las Vegas. This Jeep is still around, and it sits as a trophy in their garage, which is kind of fun. And I say garage, and it's AKA a hangar. But uh, anyway, it's really fun. Um, to introduce you to one of my other favorite and amazing SOS partners in life is my husband, Rob. Rob and I met after I came home from my mission. And we did the BYU plan. Uh, we did not beat it, meet at BYU, but we met on a blind date. And four months to the date later, we were married. Six weeks later, I got pregnant. Um, <laughs> And two weeks prior to my first son being born, my brother, Mike, came to us and said, hey, other brother is going on a mission. Do you want to come work for us? Now, that doesn't sound very exciting. 
you know, to go work for somebody when you're a family, an entrepreneur family. So we said, no, but we'll buy in. Now, keep in mind, there were no jobs on the calendar. This was a custom deck building company that they would work on the summer to feed their habit so they could blow up the garage and then go back to work and feed their habit. But we said, we'll, we'll buy in. There wasn't a single job on the calendar. My oldest son was due in two weeks. And Rob and I sat down together and we said, okay, Heavenly Father, our lives are very much your lives. That was a commitment that we made to each other going into that relationship. I had a period of time when we were dating where he asked me to marry him. I knew I wanted to marry him. And I thought, well, okay, I need to have some faith. And my patriarchal blessing was very specific about the man I would marry. And, but I said yes. And the next morning when he woke me up, I said, I can't marry you. <laughs> he, he didn't even know what to say. I didn't, I didn't know if I was brave enough to say it. But I said, Rob, my patriarchal blessing is very specific about the man I would, I would marry. And it says, but at the appropriate time, thou wilt make a choice with regards to an eternal companion, that he will come to thee and thou wilt know as thou dost look into his face that he will be thy companion and sweetheart. And with his spiritual beginning, thou wilt know that thine is bound for eternity. And I told him about that. And I said, I said yes, because I was hoping that my agency had to have a, that the reason I hadn't had the answer was because maybe I needed to exercise my agency. And for three weeks time, we paused this this deep and incredible love. It's like we had known each other forever, waiting for this answer to come. And it reached a point where we said, well, if it's not right, then maybe we need to break up and part ways. And so we broke up, and I dropped him off at work, and he was, you know, the tears are running down his face, tears are running down mine, and four hours later, I called him up. I said, well, if this is so right, why does it feel so wrong? And we got back together, and we continued dating, <laughs> and we decided we'll just wait. You know, this BYU plan, fast track. We thought it was a great idea, but we thought we'd wait. And a week later, he picked me up for a date. And I had kind of, you know, it's like, Heavenly Father, whatever. You tell me. I am more committed to you, Heavenly Father, than my own wish and want. And Rob had also gotten to that same point, that if that meant walking away from each other, we would trust that, that there would be something else equally amazing. <coughs> And that night had one of the most profound experiences of my life. And I knew as I looked into his face that he would be my companion and sweetheart. And because of that experience, when it came time to make the decision about do we invest in this company and leave health benefits and leave all of the security of four years as a journeyman in the electrical trade, we said the, the spirit was so strong. It was like, okay, well, we don't know what we're going to do. <clears throat> no jobs on the calendar, but this is where the Lord wants us. With that, um, it must have put me in enough stress because the very next morning I was in the hospital giving birth to a six-pound, 11-ounce little boy. And I had Rob with me for the next two weeks, nonstop at my side, to be through those early phases of baby, which was an incredible blessing. And then the first job hit the calendar and never stopped thereafter. And we grew that company to be one of the largest custom deck building companies in the state and eventually sold that to one of our foremen. The, uh, we trained our kids in construction by taking them out on the job site. I was seven months pregnant in that picture. I got on the roof and helped uh, shingle the roof. We also taught our kids with power tools and when the power goes out, you know what, you don't need beaters, just take out cordless drills, put the beaters into the drills, and keep mixing your cookies. The decks we were building uh, spanned multiple levels. That is actually another story below that, and we started building decks into, or spas into decks, so on and so forth, and we moved through and eventually added hot tubs, again, keeping our kids alongside us. Notice in the hot tub, we were the models for the day, and we did a lot of work with our kids growing up. Eventually, um, we sold the, the, we actually, when we bought the spa company, they had, they had fish. Can you imagine what happens when you have a customer who comes in and they want to buy a $2 goldfish and you have another customer over here wanting to buy a $6,000 hot tub? You know who gets more angry about not getting attention? 
the $2 fish person. So we said out with the fish and in with hot tubs. When hot tubs were selling 8 to 12 hot tubs a month, we were selling 10 to 20 hot tubs a day. What makes that kind of difference in a business? Anybody know? For us, it was a rubber duck. We would work with the families, and they looked at all the spa stores in the valleys, and they would say, and we would say to them, well, did you want seven people in your hot tub or eight? Well, we'd like seven. Okay, what color? Did you want blue? Did you want gray? They said, well, we like blue. Well, you know what? A number of jets? Yep, because they all have jets. They all have acrylic. They all have skirts, right? All the stores do. We said, well, you know what? How many kids are in your family? Oh, I've got three kids. Well, you know what? I have a family of ducks for you. One for each of your kids and one for both of you. Which color did you want us to deliver on Saturday? <laughs> we became the largest. Think about that. How much were the rubber ducks? Yeah, this woman knows how to sell. That's all I can say. <laughs> right? Two bucks. Two bucks. Free ducks. And we closed more hot tubs than anybody else. In business, as you are creating your businesses, find your rubber duck. What makes you unique? Why do they buy from you? Because I guarantee you they've got options out there and you need to find your unique, your unique part. Uh, we were in a, a business meeting one morning with my brother Mike and Rob and I were sitting there. We were actually at IHOP. This was the home we had just built. And we were at IHOP sitting there and in the middle of the meeting, Mike excuses himself to the restroom. Rob and I are looking at each other, and I said, Rob, I hope you're not thinking what I'm thinking. And he says, I hope you're not thinking what I'm thinking. And I said, it's time for us to part ways. The spirit was so strong. There was, you know, what the catalyst was or wasn't to that. Mike came back from the restroom. It was a great meeting. No, you know, no reason to split. And we said, Mike, it's time for us to go. And he sat there, stunned, silent, and said, you're right. It's time. How do we do this? On the back of a napkin, we wrote the value we both felt was good, what, how we would get paid was good. Rob and I left that breakfast meeting at IHOP on, on University Parkway, not seven minutes from here, and we drove home to Woodland Hills to where we had just finished this, and we said, how in the world are we going to feed our family? Because we know the cell is not going to cover us forever. And we sat down and we said, okay, well, I've got in interior design and, and stuff that I've been doing for years for the clients. Let's put a furniture store in the basement of our house. And we took the 3,800 square feet in the basement, our retail buying power of the hot tubs for many years, and we started helping people design and furnish their homes as well as do, going back to a little bit of the construction. And we became one of the top known designers in the Valley, winning uh, awards at the parade homes. My rubber duck at the house was have fun and eat chocolate because, again, you got to bring that forward. I didn't have rubber ducks anymore, but the wives would bring their kids. They'd play on the playground and have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. The husbands would come and we'd make milkshakes and they would watch movies in the theater room while the wife and I were downstairs riding up between $35,000 and $150,000 worth of, of stuff for parade homes. And we became a destination location. So think about this. If you're going to go through the typical thought processes of businesses, we busted Bravo on all of them. And busted Bravo is an aviation term because, and we became very familiar with it because my husband was raised living under the airport there on the Hinkley Farms in Provo, and all he saw were pilots. So he exchanged in his Viper for his plane, and the Viper actually went away because the kids one day said, Mom, can we build a pool? Actually, they said it to Dad, can we build a pool? And Dad made the mistake of telling the kids about assets and liabilities and how he saved every day for his Viper. And the then seven or eight-year-old daughter, Larisha, um, says, well, you know, Dad, maybe we could sell the Viper because more people can get in the pool than the Viper. <laughs> Be careful what you say to your kids. They're quick learners. Anyway, but that's okay. The Viper was sold two days later to one of my clients. We didn't have to advertise it, nothing. He actually called the next day because he was thinking about buying either a Viper or a Ferrari. And I told him what had happened with the daughter. And he says, well, I'm going to go look at one. Went up to Salt Lake. Ended up, um, nobody gave him the time of day. He could have paid cash for either. And he was in t-shirt and jeans. They wouldn't even let him sit in 
the vehicle. Called us up, said, okay, I'll take it. What do you want me to write the check for? And Rob delivered it the next day. Now, when you look at life, you think, does life move along simply like that all the time? And the answer is no. We had plenty of struggles. We had one point in time where we had trusted a manager in our office in our spa company to oversee some things when the computer mysteriously cra crashed twice in a short period of time. And by the time we re-seized the office, um, because the funds just weren't turning around, the account said, you know, you really should just file bankruptcy. You know, that was a big hit to take really fast. And we were like, heavens no. I will work at McDonald's the rest of my life if I have to to pay every single penny that I owe every one of our creditors. And we fought for a year and a half to get through, through the major hit of that and negotiated with every one of our vendors to help us through it because you have to have product to be able to make money. And we paid every single penny. So life, like the exploding doom buggy, you're going to have explosions in your own businesses, small, large. And how are you going to navigate those? If you align your life with the Lord, it's not that there's not going to be troubles, but he's going to help you get through them. So we moved from aviation to a day of death. Rob had been asked by an individual to, the, to help him get home. And he needed some certain time in a plane type. He had flown in from Canada. And I drove home that day. We had a, a rule together. And that was that when you leave, you send a text that you're going up. And when you land, you send a text. But I never got the I landed text. I got the sheriff at my front door. And, you know, when that happens and your whole world falls apart, right, you have an interesting choice to make. What are you going to do? I have five kids. My oldest son is on a mission. He's been gone for a year. My youngest is sitting in the room here. He and I were at, the, at an Eagle interview, and I had sat there in that interview in the hallway, irritated because Scouts was Rob's thing. It was not my thing. I was always irritated and mad because of Scouts because I wanted to be in Scouts. I wanted to pack the tool belt with the big boys. I wanted to do all that. So that was his thing, and I sat there irritated, and... In that moment of, why am I doing this, floods through me, Kristen, you've got this. And that calm still, unbeknownst to me what had happened yet at this point, I thought, okay. So five minutes later, I'm home, and the sheriff is standing there to tell me that Rob was not coming home. You can't tell me that it wasn't Rob standing there with me at that moment saying, Kristen, you got this. And the home flooded with over 200 people within a matter of minutes. And by 11 o'clock at night, I said, I have got to take these kids to bed. We were exhausted. And we all knelt and the, in, in the home together, all of us, up the stairs, around the kitchen, into the pool table room. We just spread far and wide. The sheriff's advocate was still there. And we all knelt in prayer. And then I took my kids to the room. I had a daughter who had gallbladder surgery the day before, and she was on the bed in my room. And I closed the door behind me as each one of the kids, and keep in mind I had called my son, who was in the mission field, and got to listen to him collapse on the floor and sob knowing that his dad would not be there when he got home. And I stood there looking at my kids, and I said, in my heart, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And as clear as day flooded through me, Kristen, you've got this. God lives. Jesus is the Christ. He guides his church on the earth through a living prophet. And everything that we have been taught is true. And I took a deep breath. And I looked at the kids and I said, okay, kids, we've got this. Be mindful. Your dad will always be there. The role of husband and father never dies. Watch for it and rely on it. And that is what we have done. And going forward, I then took and I began designing statues that were indicative of that feeling, of that embrace that I felt in his arms. And took this as part of my getting up when the trauma happens and embracing the journey. Three years ago, my brother came to me and said, Kristen, it's time. You've been retired too long. It's time to come out and play again. 
And I'm going to introduce you to this phase of this brother's life because this is what led us into the next phase of our journey. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Katie. Mike Katie. Mike Katie. Mike Katie. My life revolves around anything that can fly. I've collected a handful of unique world records. World's fastest single engine turboprop. Some of the slowest flying aircraft you've ever seen. What the hell? How is it going so slow? <laughs> That's the way to enter a party, huh? What a showstopper. My plane sound effects were in a cartoon called... Hang on, you want to hear that, I promise. It's physics. Some of the slowest flying aircraft you've ever seen. What the hell? How is it going so slow? That's the way to enter a party, huh? What a showstopper. My plane sound effects were in a cartoon called Planes. I've been racing since I could crawl. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. <laughs> That's my motor mount. Should make perfect sense to everybody. rule number five and he exploded his passion into everything that he does the two planes on the top were built by he and his twin brother that beat Howard Hughes record that had been held for 50 years the fastest in plane of type from East Coast to West Coast here in the US each they flew together but one took the record one direction and the other took the, the other one this is the next plane that he did it's called turbulence it beat the record that had been held for for many years uh, by the same guy out of Canada. I believe he had it for 11 years, and he built the record by almost 30 seconds, 430 odd some odd miles per hour. That is fast enough to be a trainer for a, an F fighter pilot um, type. And then he built this one designed to land Everest. And he can take off in 800 feet a minute off of, he can take off in less time than it takes for that tailwheel to hit where the prop was at the beginning of the plane. Think about the engineering mind. Think about the parent who could have squelched the child at a toaster. You guys will raise the next generation of entrepreneurs with your kids. Be mindful about what you're doing. Encourage creativity, whatever that is, and encourage your own creativity. So next rule of business, rule number six, always take time to serve. This was the catalyst for the, what we do now. Mike was asked by a friend of a friend, of a friend of a friend, who needed to be flown up to the Vernal Basin to check on his wastewater disposal site. This is a site where they bring, bring water to that comes up. There's over 17,000 oil wells in the Vernal area. Did you know that? I didn't know that. And I've lived here most of my life. I didn't know that. But he said, can you go up and check that out? Can you drive, fly me up there? It's a three plus hour drive, or if I could just hop in the, in the plane or the helicopter with you, we can be there in a matter of 30 to 45 minutes. Mike loves to serve and he loves an excuse to fly. So they hopped in the plane and the, you know, the 35, 40 minute flight up, they're talking. Mike says, tell me about this. Wow, those are cool ponds, what are they for? And the guy dives into it. Mike asks some critical questions. Always ask questions. I don't care where you are or what you're doing, you darn well better observing life because it's going to present it. And he said, if you could solve the biggest problem in your industry, what would it be and why? And then Mike became a very good listener because he started talking about, how big is the oil industry? Anybody know? It's a mammoth industry, right? For every barrel of oil that comes up, there is also a barrel of water, sometimes eight barrels of water. But there will always be water that comes up. That's oil, that's natural gas, that's whatever it is. And it has to be disposed of. There are a couple of ways of disposing of it to sites like this. 
Um, this gives you an idea of what you would typically see, which we didn't know anything about the oil industry three years ago. Think about this, right? Do you know anything about the industries you're going into? Nope. But I guarantee you, you put enough energy and effort into something, in the next two to three years, you can be one of the experts in it. It's not hard. You just got to dive in and do it. So they bring it up. They frack to get it. They have options. They can take it to ponds like this and just let Mother Nature evaporate it. Um, they can shoot cannon, uh, water cannons like that or misters like this. And the purpose for that is to mist the water so that Mother Nature can wrap itself around it with air because it's the air surface contact and the wind will come through. And Mother Nature is beautiful and perfect because she will take every bit that she can and then she'll pick it up and carry it until she can drop it down again. That's her job, not rocket science. She knows how to do it. And the problem with the misters is they throw such a fine particle. If you think about this water, this water comes up five times saltier than the ocean. It's caustic. You can't just dispose of it anywhere. Some people will put it into injection wells and shove it down so deep in the hole that they worry, they have to go so deep because if they don't go really deep, they're worried it'll come up and leach into your waterways and contaminate, which has happened. Um, so Mike's listening to this. Here's some of the news that happens in the oil industry. In 2015, North Dakota experienced one of the worst environmental disasters, a pipeline burst, spilling nearly 3 million gallons of briny salt water in a nearby oil operations into two creek beds. Think about that and what that does to wildlife or your water source. Another one, this is recent. The water came bubbling up in a farmer's field. One day, the farmer's crop's growing beautifully. Next day, this water nonstop, like a, like a free-flowing stream, is kills a whole swath and is still dumping water onto the field, right? This is the injection system. That's how they take and they shove it way down hole. So Mike's learning all of this and he thinks in his mind, well, you know, how do we do this? Mike, um, here's some other things really quickly. Abandoned disposal wells leak produce water in North Dakota. Fluid injection wells have wide seismic reach. Think about water. You get down in those crevices deep enough, if water doesn't have anywhere to go, what does it do? It lifts. Water is a, where do you think dams and all the power supplies come from? It's the power of water. So you have seismic issues. Mining companies have issues with water spillage as you transport it, additional issues. Wastewater contamination, pollution, it's all over the place. So as Mike began studying and he reached out to me, he says, there's a massive pain point here that could be resolved. And I've started working on some ideas. Come play with me. And I said, okay, so of course you guys recognize that little drawing. Mike's really good at drawing. And he started coming up with ideas. Now that was for his plane. I don't have a picture of what he started designing for this technology, but he went so, he made a dozen things that worked. He went so far as to create a metal plate that would sit under the surface of the water that would create a sonic boom and cause the water to fog. Beautiful, perfect, okay. But the power consumption to use that with what's being paid in the industry would make no sense. So then he said, Kristen, I've got another one. Let's do this, let's layer water. Now think about the challenges here. The water is more toxic, um, salty, which means you can't use metals. If you use metals, it will rust, which means you're replacing it. You've got to serve it up in a way that it'll hold it from other nature. If you think about this, if I were to take this and I take the lid off of this and set it outside, how long would it take for Mother Nature to evaporate that? A long time. If I take this same bottle of water, I won't do this on your floor, but if I took it and I tipped it outside and let it spill onto the concrete or asphalt, how fast will it evaporate? Instantaneously. That was the principle he set his mind out to, which then went from concept to actual, and we began problem solving how to get water to stick to a duck's back because you have to do it with plastic. The first iteration was like this. We didn't want to have to use pins or clips because if you're building these, could you imagine toting around a whole bunch of pins and clips and snapping them together? So he built it so the, the parts would actually, you want to hold that for just a second. You could take and put them together. Let me show you. 
See that? So these snap in, and everywhere they snap, there is a top and bottom, rhyme or reason to this, yes. And everywhere they snap, he was building in a, a bearing point into the corner of each. We then took it and said, you know what? You guys are going to grow your businesses, find cost-effective ways to do this. And this became how we tested. Love Home Depot. Why do you want to spend thousands of dollars to have an external firm test something if you can go to Home Depot, build a base, put a water thing on it, fill it up, put a measuring stick, you get creative. Well, that wasn't, uh, we needed to go bigger because by the time we put a big enough base, uh, that support structure became so strong that that one tub didn't do it. We went from there to internal testing. And we'll go through these quickly and I'll skip that because you'll see it again in a minute. And then after we had tested and got a basic understanding, we did a pond inside the hangar and another tower next to it, and we started testing the evaporation rate. And we got it to a point where we thought this is pretty good. We took it out into field, and we actually ended up buying the facility out in the basin because you don't know anything about an industry until you own it. And so we thought we've got to figure this out in full. Took it, started building, creating, got it down so you can put it together with a rubber mallet. We can build these the size of Walmart, if that gives you an idea. The first one we built, it even has stairs that go into it. And with that, we started with water distribution. I sat down with my kids and I took it to the Lord and I said with my kids because they became partners with me after Rob died and I said how do we do we do this and why would we not do this and we made this decision together as a team um, which I really really appreciate when we did our external testing for real we did two ponds out at the Vernal Basin which is the one that you saw and we tested a base pond with measuring coming in to fill the non ecovap segment and then this version and this was our result 59 times faster than mother nature we paid the top international firm to come out in the oil industry to validate it for us because although short and quick validation is good on your own but there reaches a point where you have to go big um, just quickly so you can see this, environmental sound, we had John Pitchell of Ball State University come out. Environmentalists do not write good reports on anything in oil and gas, rule of thumb. But they gave us the stamp of approval and we are the only technology that is actually leaves a zero footprint. If we move, we can disassemble it, take it and transport it to the next spot. Um, we built the first tower on our facility in Vernal to prove it out, you can see the water in suspension, how you can see all the way down for cleaning. And there's a lot of things that go into this. You can see this from the air, the mass that these are. We went into problem solving. How do we deal with places that don't have area space to put it on? And we created a system that floats. Again, we had to look at the, the distribution and we cut out making our own spray heads. And then we said, you know, we can handle the water that comes to us, but what if we could go right to the wellhead, to the source, and eliminate trucking and take some of that revenue as well? So we designed the possibility, and with version two, we were able to get an increased enough evaporation that we could go right to the wellhead and place our first one in Eagle Ford, Texas. Since we've installed that, we haven't had a single truck move off of that site to transport water. You think about the liability release that that is for them. It's beautiful, magical. 
reduced the cost by 35% and trucking by 95%. The reason it's 95 is eventually there's enough of a sludge in the bottom that you have to back pump that out and take it to, to be tilled into to the earth for natural processing. It becomes compost, so it's totally reusable. We went into power plants. We've eliminated, reduced the cost by 40%. We've gone into the mining sector and floated this, increased 60% evaporation rate. This is this past year that we've done all of this. And we have been featured now as the one of the top 10 um, technologies in this industry. We have improved on it since, and that is the addition of these splash guards, because again, we're all environmental. We can now control the water to a direct hit and down, so there's, there is no overspray at all of any kind, which Scott, I'm sure you're loving seeing this. This is Scott hasn't seen any of this. So anyway, and then you see the seismic clips. So the point of all of this, the magic that's in business is you. You are the rubber duck. You are what's important. You are what matters. <coughs> Excel at what you do. Surround yourself with the best people. The fact that you're in this class, rubbing shoulders with Scott and his, the amazing people he brings in here is critical. Ask the right questions. Being an be an amazing listener. Never quit learning about your industry. And always, always involve the Lord. As you read your scriptures, I promise you, you will find the business clues in there that will guide you. This is the Lord's business. Your life is the Lord's business. So never stop being you. You guys are amazing. Thank you for letting me be here. And it's fun to you.